ahead and move on. Um, let's talk a little bit about how to protect your investment. So you're, you've rented the property, you're collecting rent, you have your file cabinet, you have your scanner, you have your home office, you've, you've talked to the CPA. Um, one of the things that you know, are still probably, is still probably on your mind are, is the legal side of it. How do I make sure that I'm not you know, discriminating? I'm not um, getting myself in trouble you know, with this investment that I, I'm putting in. I'll give you a couple of different hints, uh, a couple of different pointers, and then, again, this is something that I'm also keeping, um, you know, on the side at all times. Um, just so you know, I'm a very serious landlord. Every landlord's tax deduction guide, uh, every landlord's legal guide, these are two books that I keep with me, uh, or they're on my bookshelf on a regular basis. Uh, anytime I need, every time I have a question, um, I can reference these. I can tell you in my 10-year career uh, or 10 years of doing this, I have only hired an attorney once. Uh, every time else I was able to, you know, like I said, understand the law enough to protect myself or to communi communicate something with the tenant um, that we could work out, you know, on our own. I've only had to hire an attorney once. So, again, for those of you who are, you know, uh, hesitant to hop into this business, again, I'm not trying to sell you on it. I'm trying to tell you. This is, you know, my experience. For those of you that are hesitant to hop into the business, just concerned about the legal sides, um, this is a great resource for you. Uh, and I'm going to go over some of the major things, some of the things that I think you really need to uh, understand, some of the more important things. So, um, number one, you want to document everything. You want to create a paper trail. Uh, one of the things that um, I wouldn't say a problem, but as you know, everyone texts nowadays. Everything is in uh, in text mode. Um, we have a lot of conversations. When you were dealing with tenants, I'll give you two examples. One is uh, the tenant calls you up and says, um, uh, what's a, you know, hey, ha you know, happy birthday. How's your day going? You know, I just wanted to let you know that the mailman dropped off some mail. It wasn't supposed to be here. That's something you don't, don't worry about it. If the tenant calls you up and says, my sink is leaking or my tub is leaking, my uh, immediate reaction is to say, I'm, no matter where I am, it's always, I'm on the road right now. Would you mind sending me a quick email address, uh, email regarding this situation? Um, well, the, one of the reasons you want an email is because you want that paper trail. You, want, you don't want there to ever be a discussion about who said what, when they said it. I told you this two weeks ago, and you didn't resolve it, and I told you this three months ago, and you took six weeks to get it done. I, as soon as an issue pops up, I want it documented. I want a paper trail about when you communicated that issue to me how you communicated that issue to me. So it's always, if there's an issue, I want somebody to send me an email immediately and let me know what the issue is and I will address it as soon, no matter where I am. I don't care if I'm by a computer and I can write it down, I'm gonna have them send me an email um, detailing that, uh, that, that, um, that issue. And the reason I don't want a text is because texts get lost. I get, I know about some of you, but I get 100 texts a day. Um, by the time, you know, I'm home and I have time to deal with this issue, that, that text is long gone. Um, and there's no, it, it takes me too long to, um, pull that up if there ever is an issue in the future and I need to verify you know that that trail so um, the second part is lead paint laws in Massachusetts any home that was built before 1978 has the possibility that's the majority of the homes in Boston I most of these triple deckers here are are built in 1902 to 19 you know uh, you know 15 somewhere around that they're all built within you know like I said 20 year span of each other um, they're all at least 100 years old at this point. Um, so majority of these buildings are built before 1978. And before 1978, they were using hazardous lead paint uh, in many of these buildings. The, in a perfect world, if you own a triple decker, you have three lead paint certificates for each unit, basically certifying that lead paint is either at uh, below hazardous levels or is removed completely. Um, so there's two ways, like I said, if it's, if it's above hazardous levels, no child under the age of six can live in that, that building or that unit. Uh, if it's below hazardous levels, then you're okay. You should have that. You should be able to have that certificate. Um, I can send, again, send you the resource. There's an online website that you can use. Um, you might just be able to Google, you know, lead paint lookup MA um, and get the website, but I can send you the resource as well. You can find out whether your units have um, lead paint, whether they've been tested, when they've been tested, and what are the results. Um, the, the reason that this is so important is because if you have a tenant who is applying for a part, an apartment you own and you are either unsure about your lead paint status or you know it has lead paint, you may have a little bit of an issue. If they are applying, you cannot deny a tenant based, you can, 
one of the quickest ways to get yourself in trouble. You can't fill out an application because I have lead paint and you have a child. That's no, that's you cannot do that. That that's discrimination. You're going to get yourself in trouble. If um, someone calls you up and says, "Does your unit have lead paint?" You can answer yes, uh, and then shut up and let them do the rest of the talking. If they hang up, no problem with that. If they continue to pursue it and fill out an application, you as a landlord cannot deny them the the uh, um, the ability to complete an application. And if you if they meet your rental criteria, the 650 credit score, the 700 credit score, the income requirements, the background check, and you have no one else that is applying at that time, you may, as a landlord, be required, you may need to remove that lead paint or address the lead paint um, before that child moves in. So be very careful. And again, this landlord legal guide is going to help you address some of the lead paint issues. There's also um, a, a legal guide that I can send you or a link to uh, by, um, that it deals directly with Massachusetts law uh, and might be a little bit better for lead paint as well. Um, if you have questions, hopefully, uh, like I said, the next break, I'll get to those. Understanding Massachusetts security deposit law, another one that can get you in trouble. Not too complex, very simple. If you, a couple things to think about, if you take a in, in, in if you take in a security deposit, um, and what confuses me is the law is not very complex. Uh, you just need to follow it. Many landlords say I'm going to take first and last because. I don't want to have to deal with security deposits. The law is too, you know, uh, too complex, and I think that's a bad move. I, I personally take first in security. The reason you want first in security is because you, you want uh, to protect your unit. You never, you want, you don't want holes in the walls. You don't want damaged appliances. You don't want broken windows. You want to have some type of asset that um, has people thinking about. Uh, when they go to, you know, like I said, live in your apartment. You want something that's, that they can hang on to. They say, when I move out, I'm going to get this $1,500 back. Um, so really quickly, security deposit law, a couple things to consider. One is that security deposit needs to be an interest-bearing uh, 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 account, most likely a checking account or a savings account or uh, some type of money market account. It needs to be interest-bearing. You need to uh, provide a receipt of deposit to the tenant and basically showing your deposit was made at Bank of America. Here is the receipt, you know, your $1,500. Um, it does not, it should not be, um, and again, I don't know about co-mingling. I personally open up a, step, a separate security deposit for every single tenant that I have. I would rather not co-mingle uh, or combine uh, security deposits into one account with other tenants. I would suggest you do the same. Uh, keep those security deposits in separate accounts. Um, you need to supply that receipt. You need to uh, keep statements every month. So as the interest grows, that interest should go back to the tenant. In terms of retaining their security deposit, for normal wear and tear, you cannot, you, if, if I'm, my fingerprints are on the wall, that's something you as a landlord have to take. If you broke a window uh, and I can prove that it was you or you're responsible for it or if there's something that was damaged, then I could you know, take a reasonable amount from your security deposit at move out and, and charge you for that, uh, that broken window. Uh, normal wear and tear, you cannot uh, damage the apartment. Yes, you can take that, you know, take the security deposit. Uh, security deposits, in, in, from my understanding, cannot be used as last month's rent. Disclosure at the bottom, I'm not an attorney. Uh, the, the law, you definitely want to, to, to research yourself. Um, but you should have, if you want to collect last month's rent, that's great. But that should be separate than the security deposit. Um, I see a couple of questions come in, but give me one second. I'm going to get through these uh, last couple pointers, and then I'll try to address you know, as, I, as, I, as I can. Um, should you require renter's insurance? Um, for those of you who are not aware, renter's insurance is um, it covers the, the, the tenant's personal belongings. So you as a landlord, you have an insurance policy. It covers the building itself. If there was a fire, you're covered. If there's water damage, you're covered. Um, if a tree falls on your house, you're covered. Problem, if you have a fire and your tenant's personal belongings, their TV, their sofa um, is damaged, your building coverage does not cover their personal belongings. You should encourage your tenants to get their own renter's insurance. It just makes sense. Um, it also makes sense for theft. If the apartment was ever broken into, um, there is literally nothing you can do as a landlord. Your homeowner's insurance does not cover theft in one of their rental units. That is what the renter's insurance policy is for. You should encourage them to get it. It's very, very inexpensive. I, um, as a tenant, 
I remember covering $10,000 in personal belongings for $300 a year. The reason most I do not have $10,000 worth of personal belongings, the reason I had so much coverage is because it also covered my wife's uh, engagement ring uh, at the time, which you can also put on that policy as well. So if it was ever lost, um, fell down a drain, it, it would cover that, and I would, you know, it would cover that um, that personal belonging. So we itemized the things that we had in our apartment: three hundred dollars, ten thousand dollars in coverage. That was um, so very inexpensive. You can go a couple thousand dollars in coverage for fifty dollars a month. Um, I would definitely encourage them to look into it, uh, and something that you may want to push hard to them, you know, at the application time, um, just so the apartment is broken into, fire damage happened, whatever it is. It feels bad as a landlord when you have to pretty much, you know, step step aside and say, I, "There's really nothing I can do for you at this point." Um, so definitely uh, consider that as you're going in. Um, tenant at will versus leases. Uh, a lease is typically a uh, residential lease is typically one year, uh, one year term. A tenant at will or TW uh, TAW is basically someone who's paying you month to month. They are not on a lease agreement. Hypothetical. You 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 apply for apartment today. You sign the lease. 12 months later, the landlord doesn't say anything to you, you don't say anything to the landlord, you now become a tenant at will. You can, the lease term is expired, you continue to live there um, as a tenant at will. The difference between a lease and a tenant at will, a lease agreement, you as a landlord cannot increase your rents during that period, you cannot change any of the lease terms, they need to, they are breaking the lease if they leave, you can't, you know, you can't raise the rents. Tenant at will, there is more flexibility. You need to give them 30-day notice in the state of Massachusetts for notice to quit or notice to vacate. They need to supply you with a 30-day notice to vacate or notice to quit. You can increase the rents, excuse me, <coughs> um, with some notice or a little bit of notice. I would encourage you as a landlord not to increase the rent um, 30 days prior to when you plan on collecting more. That is Though it's in your right, it's more or less going to upset uh, a tenant and uh, provide, you know, uh, it's just a lot of stress to that person when you come to them and say, hey, it's, um, you know, August right now and, you know, uh, October your rent's going up. Me personally, I try to provide at least 90 day notice before I increase rents. Um, for people that are for for my tenants that are tenant at will, I would I would encourage you to do the same. It just provides a little bit uh, of you know a room for somebody to breathe and basically say, okay, now I know I have three months to make some adjustments to my um, my daily or my monthly budget, so I make sure I can get that extra hundred dollars in there, whatever it may be. So I would say the law says thirty day notice. Uh, I would encourage you to provide a little bit more just from a uh, uh, you know from a courtesy standpoint. Uh, move in, move out procedures. It goes back to security deposits and protecting yourself and having that paper trail. I am going to provide you with a move-in, move-out form at the end of this webinar. I'll show you how to exa exactly how to get it. Uh, a move-in, move-out form, and if you, some of you have been tenants, you're probably familiar with this. I accepted your, your, your application. We signed the lease. You've paid me my money. I'm giving you the keys. The first thing I'm going to do with you is I'm going to go over to the par apartment. I'm going to have a representative of mine go over to the apartment with you, and we're going to walk through. We're going to say, does the dishwasher work? Is the, is the refrigerator working? Is the apartment clean? Are all the windows in, in good shape? Um, is, you know, are, there, are there damage to the walls? And if everything looks in good shape, you're going to, the tenant is going to sign off, and they're going to say, yes, everything is in good shape, or no, the refrigerator you know, wasn't working at the time. Um, or whatever it may be. The reason this is so important is because when they move out three years later, you're going to say this is damaged and that's damaged. And they're going to say, no, it was like that when I moved in. You now have documentation basically saying, no, you signed off and said the only thing that was you know, broken was the dishwasher. And I have a, now an invoice and an email response from you basically saying that dishwasher was fixed a week after you moved in. We had somebody come in there and now this, this window's broken. It now gives you, again, that paper trail. So there is no argument at the end of that lease term. Um, everything was in good condition. Now it's not, you know, like I said, we're going to have to, you know, assign a reasonable amount to your security deposit so we can go uh, and, and cover those damages. Uh, re lease renewal time. Um, I would say, you know, like I said, typically it's what, it's every 12 months. Uh, uh, sorry, it's at least it's typically 12 months. Now I understand what I was getting at with that. You would ideally, as a tenant, really want to come to your tenant, uh, or as a landlord, want to come to your tenant maybe two or three months before lease renewal uh, time and say, you know, I plan on keeping the rents the same and you can sign another 12-month lease. 
uh, in a couple months, or you know your lease ends in you know in 90 days. Um, do you plan on moving? Do you plan on staying? Uh, if you plan on staying, the rent is going to be X. Um, so you really want to touch base with your tenants. I would say 60 to 90 days before their lease is up, just to get a direction of which way they plan to go. Another, even regardless of whether you plan on in, increasing rents or anything else, the reason, the other reason you want to do that is because you want to minimize vacancy. If you wait until the last month and you decide your tenant says, "Hey, the lease is up. I'm out of here." you've lost a lot of marketing time, you've lost a lot of time where you could have been proactive getting that rental unit ready for the next available tenant. In a perfect world, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, um, your tenant says, I'm, I'm leaving, I don't plan on, I'm moving, I, I'm moving out of state, I don't plan on renewing in the next 90 days. You now have a 90 day you know, period where you can start marketing that rental, looking for new tenants, um, getting the repairs done that need to be done in that unit and preparing for uh, and minimizing your vacancy time when that tenant leaves. Uh, entering your tenant unit uh, in, a, in a normal situation, <coughs> uh, excuse me, uh, in a situation you need to, to provide your tenants with 24 hour notice. Um, there are certain situations where it's an emergency, the building's on fire. Um, there is, you know, let's say for instance, I, you know, I recently had to do this where um, a toilet was overflowing in unit two and it was leaking down into unit one. In that particular situation, it is a, a health emergency for the tenant on the below unit. I did not provide notice. I was you know, in that, you know, it's particular situation. I'm going to go right in. But any type of appraisals, inspections, normal visits, you really want to give your you know, your tenants at least 24-hour notice. Um, and from a, from a, again from a courtesy standpoint, a per, a standpoint, from a professional standpoint, you really would ideally like to provide them with even more notice than that. If they have family from out of town coming over, if there's something else there, um, you really want to provide them as much much notice as possible. Um, last point, and then we'll uh, try to get to any questions you have. Uh, Section 8 vouchers. Um, as a person in the business, and I, I, this is what I, I do on a daily basis. I live, I breathe, you know, the real estate business. I hear a lot of um, a, a chatter about Section 8 tenants and what's right and what's wrong. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of my opinion, then I'm going to try to give you some fact. Uh, fact: Section 8 tenants, uh, a, a tenant with a, a municipal voucher, a BHA voucher, a, a metropolitan housing voucher. Um, there is assumption that they somehow need to be treated differently than a tenant that comes to you market rate. Uh, and that, in that sense, I mean you can't collect a security deposit, or you um, you don't need they don't need another job. That's that's false. The 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 same requirements that you have for your market rate tenant is the same requirements that I would encourage you to put in place for anybody with a Section 8 voucher or a housing voucher. Meaning they still need to supply. A, uh, you with a 650 credit score. If that's what you're asking for, don't ask for it from them and not from market rate tenant, but as long as your standard is good across the board, great. They still need to have, and again, you determine what this number is You know, for these tenants. This is where it kind of gets a little gray. They still need to have extra income. The metropolitan housing voucher will cover their rent, um, but a lot of times that doesn't cover the uh, utilities. If your utilities are separate, they still need extra income to cover the utilities. They still need to pay for food. They still need to pay for um, you know uh, other living expenses. So having a Section 8 uh, voucher is not enough for me. I'm still I'm also looking for other income. How are you going to pay for the gas? Um, um, and I'm speaking I'm speaking from personal experience. I've had a tenant with a Section 8 voucher, and literally all winter her gas was off. In one of the worst winters we've had in Boston, and it, it, it causes problems for other units in the building. So hopefully, I'm helping you avoid that. You really want to make sure that they not only have the credit score that you want, but other income. And then there's this assumption that you can't, you know, can't ask for a security deposit. You absolutely can. Um, they want you still want the income. You still want the the uh, the uh, credit score. And I absolutely want a security deposit from you as well. So Section Eight Metropolitan Housing, whatever it is, is going to pay your rent to me. Um, but I still have requirements from you as an individual for the security deposit, the credit score, and the income. For some reason, if they don't meet those requirements, then, like I said, I'm going to move on to the to the next tenant uh, and wait for somebody who does. If they do, then I'm going to have to do what I have to do to to make accommodations to get that that tenant in there. One of the other things that I can say to think about with Section 8 um, voucher or the Metropolitan voucher or uh, BHA or whatever whatever the voucher program is, there is usually there is typically an inspection. There's an inspection before move in, and there's an expect an inspection yearly uh, in most cases. The 
the problem that you may have if you want somebody quickly into your units, sometimes it's a little difficult to get Section 8 because, again, uh, I can't remember who asked the question about BHA, they take a little longer to get out to your property, do the inspection, get back to their office, you know, approve the apartment, um, and then actually pay you the money. Sometimes that takes a little while. The beauty of it, though, is once it starts, it's automatic. There's no chasing tenants for rents. There's no, you know, you know, I'm going to give you $700 now and $1,500 later. That it comes like clockwork. It's usually deposited into your bank account, and it's great. It's the hassle of getting it set up a little bit. Um, it's the hassle of having a somebody check on you on an annual inspection, but um, the lack of having to you know, worry about whether the, you know, the rent's going to be there or not is, is not there, and that part of it, you know, can be great. So how many, uh, again, uh, disclosure, I'm not an attorney. Um, I'm providing you with my experience, you know, my uh, experience as a tenant, uh, but I would encourage you to, um, uh, again, use this as a resource, and I'm going to send you some other resources as well. Uh, you mentioned you use the Bank of America account and have tenants deposit to your account. Does your BA charge a lot of business fees for that? Absolutely not. There is no fee whatsoever. Um, there is no fee. Abs absolutely, it's just a general deposit. It's a it's a business checking account. The only fee that you have, I think, is if you drop below a minimum balance. And again, I think it's maybe two thousand dollars or something like that. And um, but no, no fee for depositing money into the account. They are literally going into a a bank account branch. They're writing the Mandrell company at the top of the deposit receipt. They're taking the account, account number and they're putting that in there. They're taking either their check or cash or whatever it is. They're handing it to the teller. It goes into my bank account. Hopefully it's cash because it goes into the bank account um, you know, and is available to me immediately. So there are, there are no fees um, associated with using you know, that service. One second. Uh, what happens if a child is born with uh, and the tenant? Uh, an, uh, what happens when a child is born while the tenant occupies a unit that has lead paint? Very good question. Um, so the question is, in, in summary, if I move a tenant in, there is no issue with a child under six, but they actually have uh, someone, uh, a child, while they're there. A child is born. In that situation, um, you as a tenant, that it's a it's a really tough situation. That's one of the and again, that's why I think I put it at the top of the you know, the page after, you know, the paper trail, that in that situation, you would probably have to remove the lead paint. You would probably have to notify your tenant. They should have signed a lead paint disclosure on the way in anyhow, um, but you really want to work with that tenant at that point to um, deal with that lead paint. So there's a couple ways you can deal with lead paint. You can do uh, a removal or remediation. You have to have a company come in and and they make a big deal out of it. It's hazmat suits and there's all this type of stuff. It can get expensive depending on how much lead paint is there. Sometimes you have lead paint, but it's only on the exterior of the house. Sometimes you have lead paint, but it's you know only on a couple window seals. Um, so there's the, the remediation or the removal, and then there's also encapsula encapsulating paint. If there's low levels of lead paint, uh, when I say low levels, I mean right above hazardous levels, because I actually have lead paint in one of my units, but it's 0 0.001, you know, in terms of hazardous level. So it's below that 0 0.05 or whatever it needs to be, um, where it's even if it's consumed, it's not hazardous. If it is at a hazardous level, you could use encapsulating paint um, to take care of that. And again, there's going to be you know certain guidelines, and I can send you another. There's another resource if, if you you know put together uh, or type into Google Massachusetts lead paint law. There's a brochure that they have, and I can also send it to you as well. It lays out all these different things, and I what I don't want to do is get into too much of the legals of it because uh, I again I'm not an attorney. I don't want to give you any false information, but those are the two ways that you can get rid of it and deal with it. But uh, and in that situation, if you have a child born into the unit that has lead paint after um, there's a tenant already there. Uh, unfortunately, you know, again, fortunately and unfortunately, you're going to have to, um, you know, get that lead paint removed. The benefit of it is once it is removed, now your building is essentially worth more. You're, if you ever go to sell it, you know, that person or that potential buyer is not going to need to uh, take care of it. Hopefully, you can get three lead paint certificates, four lead paint certificates, uh, and increase the value of your building. Um, good idea to mention the apartment condition statement in terms of secure deposit. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, one second. Uh, what is best way of marketing to find another tenant? Uh, and again, we talked about that at the top of the uh, at the top of the presentation. It depends on what you're um who you're looking for. 
Um, Craigslist is the most popular thing, but it's so flooded right now. Um, it, I'm going to be completely honest with you. If you have a rental unit right now in the city of Boston or even within 40 minutes of the city of Boston, um, you shouldn't have – I mean, you can put it pretty much anywhere. You can stick a – uh, you know, a bumper sticker on your car, and you'll probably get 15 calls at this point. That you know, inventory is so low, everyone's looking for an apartment. Um, but it depends. And to answer your question, it all depends on who you're looking for. For instance, I have a couple rentals in Dorchester. If I know that you know I'm looking for students, I might actually stop by UMass Boston or email the uh, you know the um, I can't remember what the director's name is down there, but the director of housing, student housing, let them know there are awesome off-campus units that are available. This is what I'm charging. Here's how you contact me. Uh, if I'm looking for, you know, professionals and I'm in Cambridge, I might go or, you know, um, you know, in the, in the city, I might actually go to, you know, Longwood Medical or one of the hospitals over there and actually, you know, post up something in, you know, in the, uh, you know, something that, you know, in the break room that the uh, surgeons can see or the doctors can see and something that's available. So it all depends on who you're looking for. The easiest method is to actually go right on Craigslist. The problem with Craigslist is you're going to get, it's not very targeted. You're going to get anyone and everyone calling you. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, how to kind of get away from that property management side and how you can use a realtor, you know, to, to, to stem some of that as well. So one security deposit that you hold for your tenants is that considered income no your security deposit is not income uh, it is a return to them it's basically just a deposit um, for your security you know and, and for lack of a better term um, you're it's not considered income you're basically just holding it uh, in case there is damage to your property I've never actually had to uh, go after someone's security deposit when you have two thousand dollars in, in a checking account or bank account somewhere and that, that person knows. They've, they've, they've paid you first month's rent. They've paid their fee to the realtor or whatever it is. Then they give you another $2,000. They know. They, they, you know, like I said, will treat your uh, apartment or rental unit with respect because at the end of the day, they want that money back to them. Uh, and as long as you are taking it in, giving it back to them, no, it's not considered income. Good question. It may be considered income if you are, if you do take a portion of that uh, later on. Actually, it may not, it, and there's no maybe in it. There's definitely income if, for instance, they damage, they break a window, uh, and you take $200 from that security deposit to fix the window, that income is going to be immediately offset by the expense of fixing the window, but that it is income, so. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, let's move on. Um, so landlord-tenant forms. I'm going to talk a little bit about the forms that I have for you and a little bit about their use. Obviously, the tenant application, pretty straightforward. You want to have an application that captures you know, all the information that you want. Um, a little bit about application. You should have an application for anyone who is over the age of 18 that's going to be occupying the unit. They don't necessarily have to have, let's say you have an adult son or an adult daughter that's going to be uh, occupying that unit. I want an application from them if they are over the age of 18, uh, regardless of whether they're going to be paying the rent or not. Any adults in the unit, any children, I'd like their name and, you know, like I said, their age. Uh, and their address on the application, but I'm going to give a separate application to any adult applicant that's there. Um, one of the things I want to be mindful, you know, I want you to be mindful of, um, and one of the things that I forgot to mention in, you know, drafting up your lease clauses. Again, I, 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 over the 10 years that I've been doing this, I've, you know, not everyone, not everyone's a scammer, and I don't want you to think that, you know, like I said, everyone's out to get you. But you really want to, um, you know, understand how people try to work their way around the system. And the more you understand that, you, the better off you'll be. And by that I mean when you're taking an application and I'm drafting up lease clauses, the other lease clause that I have and that I think is really important, um, and I think it's very, I think it's pretty standard, is say, for instance, um, uh, you know, a woman rents an apartment, it's her and her two young children, and then, <laughs> this may sound horrible, but, you know, her, her old boyfriend is fresh out of jail and he decides to move into the apartment. Um, as a landlord, I am not renting to him. I'm renting to you and your children. I have the right to say if additional occupants, I need an applicant, I need a, an, an application from any additional occupants that you plan on, uh, uh, you know, occupying that apartment. Anybody else that you're going to give a key to for an extended period of time. If they're visiting for a couple of days, fine. Anybody who's going to have a key for more than two weeks, they need to fill out an application. I need to verify who these people are as well. I'm not looking out just for my own interests. I'm looking out for the interests of the other tenants in the building. If I'm going to have a criminal or someone else in the building so, you know, that is, it may or should not be there, I need to, to, to know about that. So I think that's an important you know, uh, you know, clause that you put in there and it's something that's important for your tenants to understand right from the start is 
if there is going to be an, an additional applicant or additional, uh, excuse me, additional occupants in your building, they need to apply through me and they need to be approved by me as the landlord before they get access. Or if not, we're going to have a problem and you're in violation of your lease at that point. So uh, keep, please keep that in mind. Uh, standard lease agreement, we'll have that in there for you. Th no matter how standard this lease agreement is, you're going to have uh, and again, I, I think it's further down the lease, lease addendum example. So my lease, and again, there is nothing in my in a standard lease that says anything about satellite dishes. There's nothing in the standard lease that says anything about exterior water use. Um, so these are all lease uh, clauses or things that I'm going to put on my lease addendum to add. Um, so you're going to sign the standard lease that says, this is the rent, this is the lease term, blah, blah, blah. And then you're going to sign a lease addendum basically saying these are all the rules and regulations for this particular property. And again, you might have different rules and different regulations for different properties. If you own a property in, you know, uh, in Middleborough uh, in the suburbs, it might be completely different than the way you treat um, your property in, in Cambridge. So depending on the building itself, um, what are the, the threats that you have as a landlord and your tenants face? Um, you're going to, you know, draft up your lease addendum, you know, accordingly. A holding deposit form. Very, very important as well. I've been burnt this way uh, several times and I want to help you uh, uh, avoid being burnt here as well. Give you a hypothetical. Tenant applies for an apartment, best tenant, perfect credit score, uh, meets the, you know, the income requirement and no clean background check. I love you. I want you in my building that you're exactly who I'm looking for. And the date is September 4th. They're moving in October 1st. I basically said, yeah, let's go ahead and make something happen. Let's, you know, let this, let this go on. They plan on moving in. They're all smiles. We're having a good conversation. It may, seem, it may seem silly now, but there's points where I walked, I took their word for it. I, I walked away and basically said, yeah, I got a tenant. They're moving on October 1st. I didn't take anything from them. I didn't take a deposit from them. I didn't take anything as a, as a holding deposit or money to hold them to that commitment for the next 27 days, the next 24 days, or whatever it is until they moved in. They went out and continued to search for another apartment. Um, I was in love with them. I thought they were in love with the apartment. They went out and searched for another apartment, found a better opportunity for me, for, for them. I foolishly waited until you know the 27th say hey let's you know or 26 and said hey let's you know let's plan a date where I can exchange the keys and I'll get the first month's rent from you and we'll do all these things oh I'm sorry I've actually already found another apartment and, and it didn't even bother to call you to let you know so what a holding deposit is it means basically says I understand that you're paying another landlord right now but I need something from you right now a five hundred dollars is typically what I take a five hundred dollar holding deposit so basically I'm withholding this property from the market I stop renting this I start marketing this property I'm no longer looking for another tenant um, there's a significant amount of time 15 two weeks three weeks between the day that we're having this discussion and the day that you're moving in so what I need from you is a five hundred dollar holding deposit here's your holding deposit receipt here's basically saying the, the its first last uh, it's first in security to move in, so that's three thousand dollars, assuming the rent is fifteen hundred bucks. You're giving me five hundred dollars today as a holding deposit. At move in, you owe me another twenty five hundred bucks. If you decide to go out and take another apartment, that's fine. Now I have to put this apartment back on the market, but I'm keeping that five hundred bucks from you. There's a form in there, um, and I supply that for you as well, uh, and you can use that. And like I said, please protect yourself from that, uh, you know, uh, unfortunate situation as well. Um, so move in, move out form. We talked about that. Uh, standard re rent increase notice. Uh, so again, if you're, you don't really want to just send your tenant a text message basically saying your rent is going up. Uh, you can you can do that, but I would also send a standard notice, uh, maybe a PDF notice attached to an email, um, or, in, or in addition to that, also put it in the mail and actually send it to them. You want to make sure that they, there's multiple you know levels of communication there to make sure that they oh, I didn't know and you know like I said you didn't tell me or I didn't get it and I didn't get the email I, my email was down I don't have that email address anymore send it to them multiple different ways uh, to make sure that they were informed of that uh, rent increase uh, lease addendum example and again we talked about lease addendum uh, lease renewal form so again you want your tenant to stay um, basically what the lease renewal form basically says is uh, everything that was in the original lease a year ago is now going to continue for the next 12 months. You sign here, I sign here, great, we're good. Um, a 30-day notice to quit, tenant at will or lease is over. I don't want to rent this apartment anymore. I want my mother-in-law to move in. I don't want to rent this apartment anymore to you because I want to raise the rent. Or I have another tenant that I think you know I, I would like to move in. Your lease is up or you're a tenant at will. I'm providing you with a 30-day notice to quit. Um, 
and again, depending on how serious it is and how you might want to send them a certified letter just to make sure that they got that as well. Um, but that, that standard form is in there as well. And then there's several other notices, several other forms that you can use. Again, these are um, standard landlord-tenant forms. Depending on you know where you are, if you're outside the city, if you're inside the city, you really want to you know uh, make sure that they again. I'm confident they are, but you want to make sure that they're within Massachusetts law as well. Some of these, you know, like I said, it's what's a form that you can use in Florida may not be the same thing as the form that you can use here. So you want to make sure that they you know abide or, or, or uh, you know abide by Massachusetts guidelines and landlord tenant law.